So we'll see in a week and a half when you're going to come up to another wall and there's no speaker of the house. Of all this. And one more thing about the assumption belt. It also led to a tax on whiskey that led to the whiskey rebellion. Okay, another one. Any other questions? That was Camel. That's the assumption belt. So another question. Oh, I, after going through this, I put stars by ones I wanted a, uh, I wanted a short ID on. The Federalist paper, it will only be on Federalist number 10. And I accidentally put down out of 20 for Federalist number 10 when I was putting them all in. It was originally out of 10. It has been changed. So you guys, every other class will be out of 10. You guys out of 40. I think that's fair, right? You'll be out of 10. So if it got, it's, it's been changed. I just didn't catch it. So that's Federalist Bill. Same thing with three-fifths compromise. The short ID, your ch that will be one of your choices. And that will only be on three-fifths compromise, not on the slave trade compromise. Okay, you said the assumption Yeah, one of those two and then three others. What's the difference between the Hamiltonian economics and what? Well, I just explained the assumption bill a yeah. couple seconds ago. The assumption bill was part of Hamiltonian economics. Hamiltonian economics was the idea of using strong central government to funnel money to the very wealthy. Nice. In any way possible, but the big way he wanted, he wanted to funnel money from agriculture, especially small farmers and also working class people. He also wanted very low wages. Funnel the money to the very wealthy because the wealthy are better. That's the government of a better sort, and they will know what to do with that money. They will build industry and finance. He also wanted a strong military in case the people revolt. Because that's what would happen in the Whiskey Rebellion. So Hamiltonian economics is feared on a small financial merchant class elite. And examples of that would be Bank of the U.S. Assumption Bill, protecting tariff. Those are all assumptions. Those are all examples. And you could use one of those also as an effect that led to the Bank of the United States. That led to the assumption bill and the whiskey tax. And that is the precursor to conservative economics. Hamilton economics is conservative economics today. By the way, just to remind you, is Montana then economically conservative or liberal? Exceedingly conservative. Taxes for most Montanans are going to go up dramatically over the next couple of years. But the idea is to give wealthy people, especially from out of state, more money. Yes? Uh, this isn't on the sheet, but uh, I've the name. Yes, Lafayette, and I just mentioned him once in class, but Lafayette was a French, was a, 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 a young Frenchman who's 19. He came over to help fight the American Revolution, inspired by the revolution. Washington kind of really liked him. He liked the idea of this young man just kind of idolizing Washington from another country. And he would go back and be at the beginning of the French Revolution and then barely escape his head. So the, there's a big park in, in the White House, in front of the White House, called Lafayette Park. It's right in front of, in the middle of it, it's a statue of Andrew Jackson. So you go there, you got a statue of Jackson, a couple things. It's kind of one of the, the great things about Washington, D.C. You have all this stuff right there. Yes? Uh, not all of them. So I'm not going to do, for example, Federalist, Anti-Federalist. I decided not to put that one as one of your choices because I, I, I'm going to narrow it down a little bit. Doesn't mean there won't be a multiple choice on Federalists or Anti-Federalists for the Constitution. And the, 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 the Republicans and Federalists will be, oh, election of 1800, I decided not to put that one. But Jefferson's philosophy will be a choice. Uh, Shays' Rebellion will be a choice. I don't know why there's an asterisk there. I don't know why. Oh, I know why. I meant to put an asterisk by Bill of Rights. Oh, okay. there, there should be an asterisk by Bill of Rights. Now, the Bill of Rights are huge. And I know there's 10 amendments. So the Bill of Rights will be one of your choices. But you will do a short ID on, I'll give you uh, the Bill of Rights, you can do a short ID on either the first or the second amendment or the fourth, that's search and seizure, or the 10th, that's power not delegated to the national government goes to the states, 
but remember the necessary and proper clause. So if you decide to do the Bill of Rights, it's one of your choices. It's the first, second, fourth, or ten. Because it's too broad, first, second, fourth, or ten. If you choose one of the, choose the Bill of Rights. And I will put that in parentheses, first, second, fourth, or ten. Well, the whole thing was about remember states were worried about not states were worried about losing their militia. Yeah. And so Madison wrote that for losing their militia, especially southern states because of fierce labor bill. Okay. But Madison did not want to give states power. He did not. He did not want to give the states that power. So he wrote Gobbly Goop. The Second Amendment makes no sense. It doesn't matter if you're if you're for having more personal weapons or whatever that might mean to you, and that they might be atomic weapons, I don't know, or you want controls on weapons. It's so gobbledygook that it could go into either way. But the whole reason he wrote it was for militia. About states wanting a militia. Yeah. Didn't he do it to get like Virginia to sign uh, Yeah, George Mason was one of the anti-federalists that he wanted that. So that was one of the promises he made along with the Bill of Rights. But, um, and he was a slave owner, so fearful of rebellion. But um, he, <laughs> he didn't want it at all. That's right, it, it's a mess. That amendment is a total mess. There's a lot of laws that are messes. We'll go through a couple more. Kind of, it's all, usually on purpose, any others. Any others? Dane, what are you looking up? I'm going to ask for my friends to send me because Okay, do it another time. Any others? Any other questions on that? I'm going to add one more short ID choice. I'm just going to do it today because we're going to talk about it today. On the fourth column, there's nationalism. I will give you that choice. Nationalism. Just it's just a choice. So you do either a subject bill or Hamiltonian economics, and then I'm going to give you, I think, six choices. You pick three. You have lots of choices. Now that's good and bad, right? You have lots of choices, but that also means the ones you choose you should know. But we should you want short ideas. You want essays. Because you get to write what you know. And even if you don't know it completely, you'll get some credit. I know it's more work. Get over that. You want to do that. Multiple choice, if you get it wrong, just make a stupid mistake or do one of those which we've all done, every one of us. You go back and question your answer and change it, which is such a pleasant feeling when you find out that you were right the first time. It's all or nothing. You want short IDs. That's why on your final, it's all short IDs. A lot of short IDs. But you also have to be putting two periods to do this. Not the second semester, first semester. Second semester, most of you have taken the AP exam. exam don't forget, AP exam. And then we're going to do the semester test a week and a half after. Let me show you. Because I, I know what you guys have been working, been working for. Any other questions? Anything you're not sure about? I'll answer them, I'll go through it. You, are you guys ready for the test now? You want me to give it to you? Are you sure? Look through the list, everybody. Make sure there's something you don't know you can ask right now. And of course, not everyone is going to be on the test. I narrow it down. The XYZ affair was an attempt during the Adams administration. We we're trying to stop French pirates from stopping American ships. And they, French diplomats demanded a bribe from the United States. And the United States was furious, the Adams administration went nuts, and that would lead directly to the Quasi War, which was, it wasn't really a war like you would think of it, but a kind of a naval, just basically a naval battle. And that would lead to the Alien and Sedition Acts, the Jefferson, or I'm sorry, the, uh, the Alien and Sedition Acts. Do I have them on here? Oh, yeah, Alien and Sedition Acts, Kentucky and Virginia Resolutions. Lots of solid apples that. Any other questions? Yes. What's the citizen? Citizen Gane. Yeah. So this was during Washington's, Washington's administration, but he was 
He was from France and immigrated to the United States and tried to get the United States involved in the French Revolution in those wars. And a lot of Federalists were saying, you know, he was a dangerous alien trying to push us into war. And so they would go back and remember him when they would pass the Alien and Sedition Acts during the Adams administration to shut Republicans up and make it harder to become a citizen. So that was Gennett. Citizen Gennett. Third column, fourth column? Oh, bottom of the second. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So after Adams lost in 1800, the Federalists created a bunch of new courts and he appointed a bunch of Federalist judges in after he had lost but before Jefferson's inauguration. Most importantly, the new Chief Justice, John Marshall. And so, you know, those Federalist judges, even after the Federalist Party disappeared in 20 years, there's still Federalists on the courts. That's why long after Joe Biden is dead, there'll be hundreds of judges. No one's appointed more judges than Joe Biden. The second person to appoint judges was Donald Trump, second most. So long after Trump is gone too, there'll be judges. Could he point them out to 30 and 40 years? Really young. Any other questions? The last eight laws. That's one of the most important parts of the Constitution. It's also called the Necessary and Proper Clause or Implied Powers. Is that in the second column? Third, first. And what it said is it greatly expanded Congress and therefore the president's power. The president or Congress can pass any laws necessary to carry out their enumerated powers. Their other powers. So, for example, they would pass um, Hamilton demand wanted a bank and said it's implied or part of the elastic clause because the government can print money. And if you answer the, the Bill of Rights for the Tenth Amendment, that's one of the big things about the Tenth Amendment. It says all power is going to the all powers not going to the federal government go to the states, but the necessary and proper and or elastic clause makes it out a real big gray area. Big gray area. Any other questions? Anything else? You're done? You're ready? Yes. Uh, Treaty of Greenville. Treaty of Greenville, 1795. That's after the Big victory of the United States over this Confederacy, Battle of Fallen Timbers right here. And it basically gave the United States most of what is now Ohio, and the rest of this land would go to the tribes forever. But of course, forever meant as soon as the United States broke it. And they started violating those treaties, and that would lead directly to that last gasp effort at Tippecanoe. And it comes this Confederacy. Yeah. Uh, Passed during the Washington administration, and that was a treaty with Britain that appeared to be pro-British, and it infuriated a lot of Republicans. And that's where you get Washington in this farewell address a warning about partisan politics because he's being called a traitor, pro-British, and wants a monarch, which is ridiculous. You know, the guy gave up power. Any others? Anything else? Yeah. The what? The last yeah, the last few will be over in a few minutes. At the Treaty of Gantt, Battle of New Orleans, Nationalism. Uh, election of 1776. Adams, Adams the Federalist against Jefferson the Republican. And Adams was, was the vice president. And when the election fought a bitter election between the Republicans and the Federalists. But the big thing was that when the election came out, Adams got the first place votes but in quirk in the constitution the second place vote went to the vice president and that was jefferson so the leader of the opposition was vice president and it showed a major flaw in electoral college they would rectify that with the 12th amendment but now we're still stuck with this electoral college so 1796 showed had that problem it would come back again in 1800. Thanks. Got him. So uh, I think there's 25 or 27 multiple choice, four short ideas. It should take you no more than 20 minutes. We want the period to do it. Yeah, so we will this on it. Do you want me to ring the bell during the, the test? Let's do every minute. 
within the last 10 minutes. So you know when to finish. All right. So I gave you a few assignments. Um, oh, I got to hand a few things back. Let me do that right now. I'm sorry about Federalist number 10. Uh, I accidentally put it at 20. I think because I did Hamilton Jefferson and Thomas Jefferson were all 20. And so I think that's what screwed me up. I just put them all, I was writing them all at 20 points, I think. So I changed it. It is out of 10, so don't worry. And let's go ahead and take your notes out. And when we do that, I'll hand a few things back. So it's out of 10, everything else is out of 20. So did we, where did we finish? Did we get to Baltimore, did the burning of the Capitol? Did we get to that? Did I tell you why they call it the White House? The whitewash. And so we got the invasion that failed, the blockade. So I showed you this picture, didn't I? I like that. I like that painting. Boy, you can really see how just bare Washington, D.C. was. There was nothing there. That's all. And so we talked about the Capitol being burnt down. So did I mention Baltimore? Did I mention Fort McHenry? Did I give yours to somebody else? I don't know. I gave mine to Oh, I think I just gave the stack. I just gave X3. All right. So this is Baltimore. I mentioned Fort McHenry. So I'll show you this picture right here. And I talk about the rockets and the cannon with the fuse, the cannonballs with the fuse. One thing about Gunpowder. Black powder is not an explosive. It just ignites and releases gases. It's really loud. And those releases of gases, that's what we call a cannonball or a musket ball. So it explodes, and it's not a huge explosion, but still, I guess it explodes to you. That's part of the reason why musket balls move so slow and their wounds are so horrific. When they hit a bone, a modern gun, I know, causes horrible damage, but let's say a hunting rifle will go right through them. And if a musket ball hits, it's so slow, it hits the bone and expands on the Assault rifles, the bullet tumble. That's why they leave such horrific wounds. Because that's the way the bullet can be designed to be really small. And these are out of 20. So, Fort McHenry, who's been to Fort McHenry? Anyone? Field trip? It's such a cool place. I like McHenry a lot. Well, on board a ship called the Tonic. Did I mention Francis Scott Key? No. Is that right where we quit? Is that sound about right? Yeah. Francis Scott Key was a young lawyer trying to get the release of a friend of his who is being held prisoner on one of the British ships. His friend was a, guy, a man by the name of William Bennett. Now I look at that name and I see Beans. I want to call him William Beans. But it was William Bennett. And he was on the Taunt. The Taunt was a frigate, so it wasn't one of those rocket ships or gunboats. But he had a front row seat. And he rode there in the 9 to the 13. And Keyes was basically told, well, we're going to have to wait to the shelf. And so the plan was knock out McHenry and then burn down Baltimore. That is the whole plan. And so this is another picture of the cannonballs. They show it as bright lights. It wasn't quite like that. You see just kind of this fuse hanging behind it. Maybe you see that a rippling in the sky. Of course, it was dark. Now, Key, when he got there then, was waiting, and all of a sudden, this massive bombardment began. So loud. So much black powder. He saw on Fort McHenry a massive American flag. It was huge. And he expected, like, of course, the British thought, that in the morning, that flag would have been brought down, and the fort, which was partially finished, 
terrible protection for the small uh, garrison would be replaced with a lifeline. They would surrender. And that's called reduced. The fort would be reduced. The force would surrender. And that would open the gate up for the British soldiers to burn down the harbor. Well, in the morning, after this spectacular bombardment, he saw what? This flag. This is a flat picture taken. This is in the 1850s and the 1870s. And the flag is massive. Now, you'll notice this is hanging from a building. These are stories. The flag is huge. And the bottom quarter, you still notice how ragged it is? People came and cut off the edges for, for souvenirs. So there's a big hunk of the flag gone. And someone even cut out a star. Some yahoo then kept a star as a souvenir. Also, how many, how many stripes? So the original U.S. flag, dunk, commissioned by the Continental Congress, is 13 stripes, 13 stars. So we got two new states, and they just added a stripe and a star for each state. You see the problem when you're going to have so many stripes. After this war, they ended it, and they, so they said Congress passed a law saying 13 stripes, and then one star for each new state, 13 for the original. But the flag would have been this massive, monstrous thing. But that flag is so big, I have no idea what the little V is. The flag was still there. Inspired by this, he would write a poem. He had a song in his head, but he wrote a poem to that beat, four stanzas. What poem did he write? The Defense of Fort McHenry, which we, everyone, calls the Star Spangled. And a couple of things. First off, that's the, on the anniversary of the battle on 4th of July, they do kind of a reenactment of it, fire a bunch of rockets. I was there in June, and they did a small one, these boats. I guess they do it kind of on weekends. It's a big national park there. The fort is really cool. The park is beautiful, right overlooking the bay. This, the flag is in the Smithsonian Museum of American History, Washington, D.C., right along the mall. And the first time I went there, it was the original flag like this. So they had the painted flag so you get an idea of the size. Look how much you could see that was cut off. And it was the original. You walk in and it's huge, this massive five-story wall. The museum is huge. Now if you go there, it's not the original flag. They have a replica as close as they get to the original. They took the original in the early 2000s, actually late 1990s they started, it took over a decade. And thread by thread, they reconditioned. And now it's in a climate, um, a, a climate um, constant, humidity control, all the humidity controlled room. It's even been to the Smithsonian Museum of American History. So a couple of us, it's really, it's kind of amazing. It's, and it's right next to the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum, which is like the coolest thing ever. I, I, love, I love that. And they're right there. When you walk out and you're in the mall, the Lincoln Memorial is right over here and the Capitol is right there. The Washington Monument is right in front of you. It's really cool. We should watch nine yeah. We should? Yeah. Get some popcorn and we'll watch it. That'll be fun. I've not seen any of those, but you should watch that on your own. Huh. You guys should watch it. And then report to report down to Mr. Larson what you saw. Okay, so it was written to a song called "To Add a Creon in Heaven." But within about he had that meter. After about five or six years, after people all over the United States were singing this in this wave of nationalism, and the song had a familiar tune. Pretty soon, they only remembered the first verse. And that's what, all, that's what all people remember today, the first stanza of the defense of Fort McHenry, which we can now call the Star Spangled Banner. And it all refers to that battle. So the dawn's early light, what we see in the morning, twilight's last gleaming, he saw that flag, the broad stripes and the bright stars before the actual shelling, the ramparts, that's the fort, 
the rockets and the bombs or the shells in air, which you can see it must have been just spectacular. But through the night, the flight was still there. And then the Star Spangled Banner. It's all related to that. It's a good fighting song. Good fighting song. Or bad one, depending on your point of view. It's not the French national anthem that literally has blood of your enemies running through the gutters. Now that's a good song, the Marseillaise. And so this one's close. After the Civil War era, it was starting to be used, but there was no formal national anthem. That was a creation at the end of the 19th century. And other songs would be popular. Actually, going into the 20th century, my country, Tis of Thee, was more popular, a lot more popular than the Star Spangled Banner, because it's a lot easier to sing. The problem is, it's the same music as, does anyone know? God Save the King. It's the British song. And so they use another British song, and to Anna Creon in Heaven. 1916, during the war, became the unofficial national anthem. 1931, it became the official national anthem in the United States. There was a little bit of debate as being, I see from this article, those who are opposed to war, pacifists, did not like the fighting measures of it. But this is the to Anna Creon in Heaven. Here's the whole um, poem that's printed after the battle. And this talks about a number of different things, but it's from this thing called the Anacreon Society, which was a British society that followed, they claimed to follow uh, the teaching of the Greek god Bacchus. Anyone know what the god goddess Bacchus? Of wine. The Anacreon Society was a drinking society where they would get together and drink as much as they could put in their body and then scream songs around a piano. This song, the national anthem was based upon, was a drinking song. And here is the actual song. And it follows it. It said, if besides our influence, ye like me to entwine the myrtle of Venus with Bacchus's vine. Why? And so the United States national anthem is the music is from a drinking song. And has anyone ever tried to sing it? Let me phrase that. Try to sing it well. It's a really hard song to sing well. Now, we can all sing songs poorly. I'm really good at singing songs poorly. But to sing it well, because in the middle it goes high and then it goes low. That's hard to do, but it's meant to be screamed while they were drunk. And so that's where the national anthem comes from. And so if you're going to out so hard, that's it. And so, one more thing. The third verse, the British were doing the same thing during the War of 1812 that they did in the Revolutionary War. What were they doing or what were they offering enslaved people? And they mention it here. And Francis Scott Key was disgusted by this. He was a slaveholder. And what he put down, this is in the third verse of the national anthem of the United States. No refuge could save the hireling and slave from the flight of, from the terror flight or the gloom of the grave. That's in the American National Anthem. And it's talking about this slave rebellion and we'll kill them all. And so once again, that complex history of America. And that's in the United States National Anthem. And then back to the land of the free, the home of the brave, except for those slaves. What happened to those enslaved people who won their freedom, fought, won their freedom, fought with the British, where they couldn't go to the United States? They would be settled in the Bahamas or Bermuda, and they would be called Americans. I'm sorry, Americans. To this day, if you go to what I know from personal was Bahamas, it's I'm American and really proud of their being related to these former British soldiers who fought for their freedom, which I just find fascinating. I love the fact that they're so proud of it. Here's a grave of some of the first Americans. And this was one of the first meeting halls for the Americans when they got there. And I, I, I just love the fact that they're so proud about it. I, that, I really like that. But it shows, once again, this complex history. During the Civil War, the Fort McKenna was used as a prison to put Confederates in, or anybody that Lincoln basically deemed as being dangerous. 
He arrested thousands without charges and trial, no habeas corpus, and put into prison during the war. Lincoln was ruthless. One of those people in prison was the great grandson of Francis Scott Key. He was in prison in Fort McHenry. When there was another just strange crossroads of history. So back to this. Oh, so Fort McHenry held. Baltimore, therefore, was not burned down. The British just retreated because it wasn't that big of a deal. They did what they wanted to do. They burnt Washington, D.C. down and humiliated the Americans. But this was so awful. That fall, Federalists met in secret in Hartford, Connecticut, what's called the Connecticut Hartford Convention. Federalists, about 26, and some of them were elected officials, some members of Congress. And they talked about nullification, meaning overturning laws they find unconstitutional, meaning the war. And they even talked about secession from the Union. They were angry about this war and angry at the fact that we have a bunch of Virginians as president, a bunch of slave owners, even though there were still slavery in parts of New England. Fortunately for the United States, the war ended before it could come to this. But after the war, it made the Federalists look unpatriotic, and this would help bring the end of the Federalist Party by the end of the decade. They'd be gone. Here is a Republican cartoon. This is Lady Columbia. It's also Lady Liberty. It's a com combination of the two. This is a French representational liberty, but that's Columbia. The creepy eagle, that's for the Republicans. People's rights, no bribery, no corruption. Here are the Federalists. Hartford Convention, all the pile of money, meaning they've been bribed by the, who's the crown represent? That Brit. And what creature is this? Beelzebub, the devil. The Federalists did not survive this. But that meant nullification was still around. The next time, if, next time it would be brought up would be 1833, and that would nearly take down the Union when Andrew Jackson was president. It didn't because Andrew Jackson was president. So while the Hartford Convention was meeting in Ghent, now, this is not in Paris because Napoleon had just surrendered. Ghent would eventually, 18 or 16 years later, would become a town in Belgium, the new country of Belgium in 1830. Ghent, really cool town. A treaty is being signed by Americans and the British. Neither, by 1814, both sides wanted out of this stupid war. Just wanted out. And they ended up signing a treaty. This should sound familiar. Status quo antebellum. The way it was, what's antebellum mean? Before the war. Like it was never fought. They just wanted to act like this thing didn't happen, even though it did. And it would change everything. The War of 1812 would be huge, but not necessarily on the battlefield. It was signed on December 24th, 1814. But then it's got to go back to the United States. December 24th. I should have some of you thinking, well, that's Christmas Eve. Don't forget. For Christians, Christmas was not a big holiday yet. Not at all. Christmas wasn't that big of a deal. For Christians, the important holiday was Easter. The Industrial Revolution is coming, and that will change everything. 1814. The problem is, how do you tell people, let's say, New Orleans, that the war is over? You don't. But we must backtrack a little bit. 1813-1814, using the War of 1812 as, as an excuse, the United States decided that they're going to knock out the Creeks, the powerful tribe right here, as a threat to expansion. It was the Creeks that Tecumseh was down visiting, trying to get them into his Confederacy when Tippecanoe happened. That failed. So claiming the British were helping them, U.S. militia under Andrew Jackson, a very talented lawyer who built himself up from absolutely the most humble means, and we will get to a lot of Jackson in about a week. He marched out with militia in 1813-1814 with some allies of like the Choctaw tribe, divide and conquer, and eventually in 1814, they would defeat the Cree at Horseshoe Bend. Horseshoe Bend Similar to Timmy Canoe, in that how decisive it would be. 
The Creeks were way outnumbered. They're, one of their main leaders was a man by the name of Red Sticks right here. Here he is surrendering to Jackson. Horseshoe Band and, Andrew, and Jackson's forces won a huge victory. That's a diorama from the actual battlefield. But Jackson's battalion commanders, so, um, so officers think about captains through majors, they disobeyed orders. Jackson made it very clear, when this battle is over, take them as prisoner, we'll send them back, we'll show that all we want is for you to sign treaties and we'll take your land. I know that sounds horrible, but what happens can be much worse. They allowed their men to massacre the Creeks that survived, that survived. And hundreds of Creeks would be butchered while trying to surrender or running away by US forces. Now they disobey Jackson's orders, but still, and, and militia, these are all militia, they're notoriously undisciplined. Let's be very clear about it. Jackson was in command. So he is ultimately responsible for losing control, which there's a lot of issues why. He was furious, but that didn't change the fact of a horrific massacre, which would kind of set the stage for things down the road. Then Jackson would march through there on his way to New Orleans because they knew the British would be coming there, and that would be the Battle of New Orleans. One of the most experienced British commanders, a general by the name of Pakenham, would lead almost 5,000 troops, and their goal, their goal was to take New Orleans. The problem for the British was this. They had more experienced troops. Jackson had militia, a few regular soldiers, pirates, former enslaved people, various tribes, Creole, just a hodgepodge. Here's the Gulf of Mexico. It was hurricane season that fall, so the British couldn't leave until December. They were literally getting ready to land right here and march across to the Mississippi. When the Treaty of Ghent was signed, they had no idea. So look at the date of the battle. It's two and a half weeks after the treaty was signed. The biggest, and in America's mind, the most important battle happened after the war ended. They just didn't know. Now the British plan, get through the swamps and the bayous, march through the river towards New Orleans. So. Here's the river, here's the swamp. It's about three quarters of a mile wide of a clearing between the river and the swamp. It's all sugar plantations. It had been drained and there's canals running through the drainage. You throw sugar in kind of swampy, muddy soil. So think about January, this muddy, frozen, awful land. Jackson, knowing he had militia, dug his men in here. They built, there's a canal, they built a big ditch behind it and then a mound of dirt eight feet high. So the British would have to go over the, through the canal, over a ditch, up an eight foot burn and his men would be protected. The British had to march across a mile of open flat land, but mud. Can you imagine mud in January? Cold and it's like a suction. Every time they put their foot in, they had to rip their foot up and it pulled their shoe off. The first British soldiers, and his plan was to basically line up in lines and run at them. The first men were carrying ladders of each line. Two men holding a 16-foot ladder to put over the canal and the burn so they could kind of climb over. And then the next guy put the ladder up and they climb over the burn. They're like carrying a big target. I always envision these guys going through the mud running like this. And they're out in the open. And they're moving really slow because there's so mud. So when Pakenham's men march here, a diversion here, at 100 yards, can with a grape shot open up. At 50 yards, all the musketeers. There's no place to hide except for behind dead bodies. A few spots they got to the ditch, Pakenham would be mortally wounded about eight feet from the um, American lines. The diversion actually worked. But in 25 minutes, it was a disaster for the British. January, there's another picture of it. You can see the line, the swamp. Look at the numbers. In 25 minutes, and that's pre-high explosives. You do not need to know the exact numbers. The point you need to know is a great American victory after the war ended, 
And Jackson, two things we have to get out of this. Jackson's going to become a hero like we can't even comprehend. And secondly, it made the Americans feel like we won the war. It made us feel like it because every other battle went badly. We just got our capital burnt, but now we feel like it. And I'll play it, I'll have to play it to you on Thursday. I will play you Johnny Orton, though. I think it's great. I'll play it, I, I promise I'll play it for you. But out of this is going to become a wave of nationalism. Do not let me forget to play. I love, I love the Battle of New Orleans. And I love the fact that it became the number one song in Britain too in 1959 and it just confused them. <laughs> <laughs> What's this New Orleans thing? But nationalism. And the thing about nationalism, nationalism is this. Important thing to understand. Nationalism is intense love of your country, which came out of the French Revolution. Intense love of your country, why? Huh? Yeah, because you live there. It's yours. It's your country. Love your country because it's your country. So this is not like patriotism, which is true love of your country for its ideals and what it stands for. It is love of your country because it's your country, therefore you love it because it's your country, therefore you love it because it's your country. But the big thing is, it's this idea that all of us with this shared identity. Now, it came out of the French Revolution. And think about the French. What do the French have? The French have been a country for a while. They all speak the same language for the most part. They all have, almost all are Catholic. They have the same common history, the same common culture. They all like snails. They all have the same basic idea. Who's eating snails? They're pretty good. You know what they taste like? Snails. Exactly like snails. And, but you don't have that for the United States. That doesn't exist. It's going to be created out of this war. So a couple of things that came out of it. Why is it nationalism? We won. There's no way you can say the United States is not independent. So we got a few things we got to get. Next, the threat to American expansion is basically gone after Kimmy Kidu and all she went. So now this is our land. We are independent, but it's ours. That is our identity. What makes you an American? It's here, it's the land, and it's ours. Yes, we're still going to take it from everybody. And next, the Federalist Party's gone. This is what we call the era of good feelings. There's only the Republicans. So this, it's a myth, but the idea is we're one party, one shared identity. The Republicans are going to blow up in less than a decade. But, you know, what the heck, right? The transportation revolution. There were no roads. This will lead to, the big thing is coming is railroads. But that will bind this area together by railroads and now highways and everything else. Last two, the industrial revolution will be triggered by this. That will bring an economic system that will bind the United States, a new market economic system called, you know, capitalism. And lastly, after Tippecanoe, I mentioned it the first time, Americans. And that is our identity. You notice it's based on the land and the fact that American US citizens own the land. And if we have all this, and it's our continent, we're the Americans, shouldn't this be ours? Shouldn't this be ours? Maybe keep going south and north. Should it all be ours? And we're the only ones in this continent that call ourselves, in fact, we give it the continent to ourselves. Mexicans do not say we're Americans. That sounds almost weird now. But why don't they? Why don't Canadians? Why don't Bolivians? Why don't Costa Ricans? I should add, I've been asked to be personally asked that by somebody in Costa Rica, Mexico, and I can't, Canadians do it just because they like to mock Americans. I should add, of course, Americans like to mock Canadians. It's a part of it, a whole neighborly thing. Goodbye, everybody. What do we have tomorrow? Bring paper and brides. Bride, I want to buy. It won't help your grade at all. I'm impeccably honest, but I will take your bribe if it's in the form of a paper. Okay, I will take it. Yeah, that's yeah, pretty good. Okay, they're amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I like the big cats from the green. And what? We get extra credit on the cats. If you make one from scratch. Okay, perfect.
Have a good day, everybody. Yeah. Right when you find work. Uh, enjoy the snow. Look at the graphs, everybody. We won't see it again until May. I don't think I'm right, but I could. We're going to have like that weird warm week. It'll look strange. In my eyes. It says in my little weather app, it might get up into upper mid 40s for a high next week. But huh? No. This is how I my little weather app. Oh, not 90. I was like, no, we're not, dude. 90 inches of rain this See you tomorrow. Yeah.